This is Dr. Dave Mathewson in his teaching on third semester New Testament Greek. This is session number 13, Genitive Absolute and Infinitives. I want to do two things in this lecture. One of them is wrap up our discussion of participles by talking about a specific participle construction known as genitive absolutes, uh, which are not super common in the New Testament, but they do occur. Uh, you do run across them every once in a while, so you need to know what they are and how to handle them. And then we'll spend the bulk of the time uh, talking about another verbal construction, and that would be infinitives. So genitive absolutes. Uh, the genitive absolute is a specific kind of participle construction, and the name genitive absolute pretty much describes its function. Number, number one, it's in the genitive case. It will be a participle that is in the genitive case, and it will have a subject that is in the genitive case as well. We'll talk about that. And then second, it's absolute. That is, it forms, it kind of forms its own clause. It doesn't grammatically modify anything in the main clause, hence absolute. And that's why it gets that label absolute, because it stands on its own. It doesn't grammatically uh, connect to or modify. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen almost Every construction we've talked about that is a modifier, it takes the same case, gender, and number, or something like that of whatever it's modifying. Uh, not so with the genitive absolute. It forms its own clause. It's absolute. It doesn't modify and pick up case, gender, and number, or something like that from another element in the clause or the sentence. But let's talk a little bit about genitive absolutes. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll put this up. We've seen this a number of times, just kind of a visual representation of a typical sentence. So subject, verb, direct object. Now, uh, one of the ways to look at genitive absolutes is to compare it with the other participle constructions. So for example, we said uh, to use this little image of a leg or a branch, that represents a modifier container. Uh, we said one thing that participles can do is function adjectively or attributively. That is, they modify one of the, another noun in a clause. And so this would be the adjectival or attributive use of the participle. And it will take the same case, gender, and number as the noun that it's modifying. So if, if the subject of the sentence is nominative plural, the participle would be nominative plural. Or if, the, uh, if, if it's modifying a direct object, which is accusative, masculine singular, the participle will be accusative masculine singular, uh, the adjectival participle. The same is true with the adverbial participle. Uh, the adverbial participle modifies and connects to the main verb of the sentence. And we said the adverbial participle will normally be in the nominative case. And the reason is it takes its case actually from the subject performing the verb. In other words, the same person or persons or thing performing the action of the verb will generally be performing the action of the participle, the adverbial participle. Uh, so uh, that is why the par adverbial participle will be in the nominative case. It's getting its case. It's modifying the verb, modifying the verbal idea. It's acting adverbially, but in modifying the verb, it's picking up its case and gender and number from the subject of the verb, whether the subject is expressed or not. Remember, in Greek, uh, the subject can be indicated by the ending of the, ver uh, of the verb. Uh, but that's why, uh, that, that's why the adverbial participles will be in the nominative case. They're getting their case from the subject, uh, whoever or whatever is performing the action of the verb, and that will determine its uh, case and gender and number. Now, when we're dealing with genitive absolutes, we are dealing with a construction that does not do any of that. That is, it does not grammatically modify or connect 
to any of these elements. And one way I like to illustrate it using this is the uh, participle and the subject. And I'm going to put it in parentheses to show that it stands on its own. It, it does not modify any of these elements like the at attributive participle or the adverbial participle or the substantival participle can actually act like a subject or a direct object. But the genitive absolute kind of stands on its own. It, 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 it forms kind of its own clause. It's not grammatically connecting to anything in the sentence, although it'll kind of sound that way when you translate it. And the key is both the participle and the subject will be in the genitive case. And I'm not sure why it was explicitly it's in the genitive case, but you will have a participle and a subject both in the genitive case. And the idea is too, by another reason I've put it in parentheses is the subject doing the action of the participle is not the same as the subject doing the action of the main verb. We'll look at an example in just a moment. But if I could kind of illustrate that in English, we don't technically have a genitive absolute in English, but if I say, uh, uh, while studying in the library, she ate her lunch. The person eating her lunch in the main clause is the same person studying in the library. That would just be an adverbial participle in Greek. While studying in the library, adverbial participle, she ate her lunch. And again, the she eating her lunch is the same person studying in the library. However, if I said something like this, and again, this isn't exactly parallel to the genitive absolute, but I've, if I said, uh, while he was studying in the library, she ate her lunch. Now notice the person studying he is not the same as the person she eating her lunch. Although there's kind of conceptually there's kind of a connection. Uh, while he was eating, while he was studying in the library, she ate her lunch. So while he was studying in the library tells us something about when she ate her lunch while he was studying in the library. But grammatically there would be no connection. Uh, in, in Greek at least. So the, the point is, with, with the, remember, with the adverbial participle that we looked at in the last lecture, with adverbial participles, the same person doing the action, oops, I'm sorry, I got that, the leg in the wrong place, uh, with adverbial participles, the same person doing the action of the main verb is going to be doing the action of the participle. But with genitive absolutes, that's not the case. The person, the subject, doing the action of the participle will not be the same as the sub that subject that is doing the action of the main verb. Now, uh, let me just give you an example that hopefully will, will illustrate this. And I want to go back to uh, a verse that we actually looked at for something else, I think, in connection with uh, the, his, uh, the uh, use of the present tense in past time context and narrative, uh, the so-called historical present, and that was Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13 in uh, Matthew's uh, uh, account of Jesus' early childhood. And in verse 13... In verse 13, we read this, And having departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared according to a dream to, Moses, to Joseph, saying, and then it goes on and tells what he told Joseph. But I want to focus just on that first part of the verse. That first, those first couple of words that I translated, and ha having departed, or when they departed, that is a genitive absolute construction. You'll notice it looks like this. Again, this is Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. So it begins, Anna
Ana corre santone al tone. Now notice this is a participle. It has a genitive ending and then there's a noun following it, a pronoun in the genitive as well. The pronoun functions as the subject of the participle in this case. See, so you, you kind of have to forget a lot about what you know about genitives at this point, because this isn't showing like possession or source or whatever, neither is this, is this is a unique construction where the participle and a subject will be in the genitive case. And in this context, the, the pronoun refers back to the previous verses where we read the account of the Magi. The Magi come and worship Christ, and then they're warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and they depart. It tells us in verse 12, they departed into their own country. Now verse 13, and having they having departed, or when they had departed. But then notice what follows. Behold... An angel, an angel of the Lord appeared. Finitai. I'll stop right there. But what I want you to notice is here's your main clause. Here's your subject and here's your verb. But what I want you to notice is the subject of the participle is not the same as the subject of the main verb. In other words, it's the wise men, or the, the magi, Alton, referring back to the previous verses, they're the ones that are departing, but now it's an angel that appears. And, and again, conceptually, this does relate to the main clause. It, it tells you something about what happened before or, or when the angel appeared, having departed, or after they had departed, after the magi had departed, then the angel appeared. So there's kind of a conceptual relationship, but notice grammatically, this doesn't relate to anything. It, it kind of forms its own, it's, it's best to see it. That's why I put it in parentheses in that little illustration. It, it's best to see it as kind of its own clause. It's absolute or, or independent, uh, irrespective of how we translate it. But uh, what it does, often does, it, especially in this case, is it provides a transition into a new scene. So, when they had departed, genitive absolute refers back to verse 12, the, the magi departed. When they had departed, now new, new, new subject, a, a, a new character on stage. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared. And so that's a genitive absolute construction. You find a, a few of them in Matthew. Uh, one, one key feature, too, is that this is also um, really helpful in identifying genitive absolutes in that they almost always, there's some exceptions, but they almost always come first in the clause, like this. So you have the genitive participle and the subject. And notice that it comes first. That's how you'll find it. A couple times in the New Testament, you'll find the genitive absolute coming after the main clause. And usually that's uh, kind of a, a, a prominent construction that adds more emphasis to it. But this is kind of the default order for the genitive absolute. And, and it makes it a little bit easier to identify. So that when you're reading a text and you see a genitive participle and a genitive noun right after it, uh, and then the other key is that the noun doing the action of the participle will not be the same as the noun doing the action of the main verb. When you have those two conditions, you're probably looking at a genitive absolute construction. And again, they often function, uh, especially when they come first like this, in a transitional matter, manner uh, to provide a transition into introducing a new topic or a new character on the scene. Uh, so that's a little bit about genitive absolutes. Again, there's not a ton of them in the New Testament, uh, but you do come across them uh, once in a while. And you need to be aware of what they are and how they, how they work. So that's the genitive absolute. So what I want to do is move on to the final verbal form that we're going to consider, and that is infinitives.
uh, at least at the level of parsing verbs, infinitives are fairly easy because they, besides the fact that they're infinitives, you're only responsible for two pieces of information, aspect and voice. You don't get person and number, you don't get sing yeah, singular plural, uh, you don't get any of that. All you get, you don't get mood. Uh, with infinitives, all you have are, they're still verbal forms, so they do communicate aspect and voice. The other nice thing about uh, infinitives is you're basically only responsible for two aspects, present and aorist. So you have a f about a 50% chance of parsing them right uh, with, uh, because they're just aorist and present. So uh, uh, yeah, when it comes to dealing with infinitives, as far as figuring out what they are, uh, uh, they're, they, they, they're a little bit easier to, to tackle because you don't you know, have to worry about person and number and, and things like that, or mood. Uh, the infinitive, it, in a way, the infinitive can be seen as a form that, uh, that express, expresses the bare verbal idea. That's all it does, just run, uh, speak, read, teach, uh, say, um, eat, uh, drink, sleep, whatever. It just expresses the bare verbal idea. It doesn't pre presuppose anything about the action. And uh, again, in English, we usually translate it with a form of to. So to eat. Uh, in Greek, you may or may not use the word to. Sometimes you'll use that in your translation of a Greek infinitive, at other times you won't. As we'll look at some examples, you'll see that uh, we need a little bit of flexibility sometimes in how we translate infinitives. Um, the thing about infinitives in Greek, too, they, can't, they may or may not have an article with them. Sometimes the infinitive can take an article, and oh, if, if the, the participle is often described as a verbal adjective by some grammarians, infinitives are sometimes described as a verbal noun. And that is, they have verbal qualities, they can function verbally and adverbially, but they can also function as a noun, we'll see, and they take articles. Uh, the infinitive can take an article with it as well. And um, what I want to do then, in light of that, is talk a little bit about, well, how can, how is the infinitive used? Uh, before we do that, though, I want to just discuss briefly a unique feature about the infinitive, and that is the subject. And I'm going to do that, put it in quotation marks, the subject of the infinitive. Uh, and I'll just call it the subject. There's some debate as to, is this really grammatically the subject of the infinitive, or is there some other way we should describe it? But as we're going to see, in, in essence, practically, it's just probably best to treat it as the subject of the infinitive. But when the infinitive takes a subject that is the entity doing the action of the infinitive, it will be in the accusative case. Now that's different from what we've seen. With indicative verbs or subjunctive verbs, in normal finite verbs have person and number. Uh, everything we've looked at, uh, uh, including participles too, but um, the uh, indicative verbs, subjunctives, optatives, imperatives, and all the ten tenses or aspects and all the voices, uh, when they take a subject, it will be in the nominative. But an infinitive, if the subject is expressed, it will be in the accusative case. And again, I, you know, I don't want to try to settle the debate. Is, that, is it truly grammatically a subject or something else? We'll just treat it like the subject of the infinitive. That is, it expresses who or what is doing the action of the verb in the infinitive but it will be in the accusative case. And so you need to get used to the fact that when you see an infinitive, if the subject is expressed, it will not be in the nominative case. It will be in the accusative case. I'll show you an example in just a moment, but this also raises an, an issue. Is infinitives, infinitives can also take direct objects, which will be in what case? The accusative case. Uh, 
So what happens if you have two nouns in the accusative case? One is supposed to be the subject and one the direct object. How do you know which is which? Uh, let me give you a, an interesting example. And this is found in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7. You have Paul saying, just as it is right, uh, for me to think this about you all of you because and what you have is um, let me start over to the right or left a little bit more here ta ekain there's your infinitive uh, with the ain ending ta ekain me and Te cardia, and then humas. Notice, so here's your infinitive. Notice that you have two pronouns in the accusative case. And this is preceded by a preposition, dia. We'll talk about that kind of construction. But dia ta ekin, there's your infinitive, because to have, to kind of be wooden just for a moment, because to have, and then me, me en te cardia humas. Now, so here we have two, two pronouns in this case. It could be any noun, but in this case, it's pronouns. And this is Philippians uh, one seven. So I see two pronouns, two nouns in the accusative case. Well, wh what are they doing? Wh which one is the subject? Remember, the infinitive doesn't take a nominative subject. It will be accusative. So which one is the subject and which one is the direct object of that infinitive? In other words, there's two way, possible ways to translate this. I could make this the subject and say, because I, uh, because I have you, direct object, in my heart. That would make that the subject, and I have you in my heart. That would make that the direct object. Or should we translate it, because you have me in your heart. Again, both are possible because... Uh, the the uh, accusatives, uh, the two accusatives, uh, one of them is going to be the subject and the other is going to be the direct object. So is it because I, would well, you have to translate the ma, I, it's, it's just, a, um, it doesn't mean me, it's, it's just a pronoun in the accusative case, a first person pronoun. Is it because I have you? in my heart, or is it because you have me in your heart? Most likely, I think most of the times, and there could be some exceptions, but most of the times, word order probably does influence. That is, the first one will be the subject. So I think those translations that translate this, because I have you in my heart, are correct, rather than because you have me in your heart. I heard someone the other day say, well, it's, it could be both of them at the same time. I doubt that. Uh, that's just ambiguity in our part. And again, I think, I think word order is the key. So it's not both. It's uh, uh, Paul saying, I have because I have you, the Philippian believers, in my heart. So just be aware of that is, is, number one, the infinitive, if the subject is expressed, the agent performing the act of the infinitive, it will be in the accusative. And then second, that raises an issue. What if there's two subject or two nouns or pronouns in this case in the accusative case? Then generally you're going to follow word order. Unless that just doesn't work and make any sense, uh, you're going to follow word order. The first one will be the subject. The second one, as in this case, will be the direct object. So let's talk a little bit about the, the function of the infinitives. And uh, actually, I'm going to uh, look at Philippians, continue to look at Philippians for a couple of other examples. 
And one of the one of the functions of the infinitive, you'll get tired of seeing this, but I'll keep I, I like to use this because I think it's just helpful to illustrate the role that the different grammatical items can play. And one of the things that an infinitive can do is fill the container of a noun in a sentence, a subject, for example, or direct object. Uh, you'll often find in infinitives uh, acting that way. Uh, we do that in English. Um, we might say, I really like to eat. So to eat would be the direct object of the verb like. I like to eat. Um, and it would, it would function to fill the direct object container in that English example. Or um, we might say, uh, uh, we might say, um, uh, to, to eat, uh, to eat is enjoyable. Uh, you know, not, in that case, to eat would be the subject of the sentence, is is your verb, and then enjoyable, kind of a, a predicate construction. Uh, but even in English, we can use infinitives, and again, in, usually in English, we translate inf or infinitives, or infinitives are expressed by to, followed by a simple form of the verb. But even in English, infinitives can act like or they can function as nouns. And the same is true in Greek. Infinitives can function as a noun in the clause. And, and we, said, we saw that grammarians sometimes describe infinitives as verbal nouns. And certainly we see the noun feature. The, the, but the, the difference between an infinitive and a plain noun is infinitives also carry aspect and voice and communicate that as well. Uh, an, an example An example of the infinitive used uh, used as as a, a noun in the sentence <clears throat> uh, can be found in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 20. Actually, I want to use a, an example from Mark 10 verse 40. I think is a little clear. 10 verse 40. Uh, to go to the Gospels. In Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 10 and verse 40, we read, but, uh, uh, but to, and this is Jesus responding to uh, James and John in a request to, to sit at Jesus' right hand. And Jesus says, but to sit at my right hand is not mine to give. And it begins with an infinitive, uh, let's see, where was that? Ta, uh, I'll leave out some of the wording, but to sit at my right hand, um, uk, esten, And then the, uh, let's see, dunai, to give. So this is the one we're looking at here. And notice the article with it. To sit is not mine. In other words, here it's functioning as the subject of Eston. What is not mine to give? To sit is not mine to give. So this is just one example from Mark 10.40 of the infinitive functioning, in this case, as the subject of the sentence, as a subject of the linking verb, esten. And there's all kinds of other examples uh, that you can find of that, of the infinitive functioning that way. The, the infinitive can also function The infinitive can also function as a modifier. That is, it can modify a noun, it can modify an adjective. So the infinitive can do, uh, can do a number of interesting things. And again, I want to go back to the, 
the Philippians 1 passage to illustrate this. Uh, it, Philippians 1 has a bunch of infinitives in it. Um, in verse 7, at the beginning of verse 7, we just looked at the end of verse 7 as an example of the infinitive uh, in, in the, the two accusative cases and which one is the subject and which was the direct object. But in verse 7 we have, uh, again this is Philippians 1, 7, and Paul says, it is right It is right, let me try to clear that up a little bit, dikaion, it is right, and then for me, amoi, and then here's your infinitive, it is right for me to think, there's your infinitive with the a and inning, it is right for me to think this, and then it goes about all of you. What I want you to notice is what is the infinitive doing here? It's further modifying dikaion. It is right to think. So here the infinitive further describes or modifies the dikaion. So you'll find, sometimes you'll find the infinitive in the New Testament modifying noun forms or even adjective forms like it does here. Dikaion from dikaios, righteous or just or right. So it is right, and then the dikaion, to think this. And here's, here's an accusative that's clearly the direct object. Uh, not the subject, but the direct object of Franine. But it is right to think uh, is one way to handle it. Another possibility, although I prefer this one, that, that, that Franine modifies the Kayan, another possibility is that this could function as the subject of, of Eston. To think is right. To think this is right. That would be another possibility, though, again, I think it's probably modifying the dikaion. But uh, the point is that the infinitive can, first of all, function as a noun, the subject, direct object of a sentence. It can also function as a modifier, modifying nouns or, or adjectives as well. Uh, sometimes you'll find grammars, grammars refer to this usage as with the fancy term epexegetical. If you ever see that, uh, don't, don't freak out or close your grammar book in despair, but that's kind of a fancy name for it. It further describes, it further explains and unpacks the meaning of the adjective, uh, in, in this case, to kion. So that's a, uh, that's a, a another function of the infinitive. To move from usage of the infinitive where it functions as a noun or it can modify a noun or, a, 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 or an adjective or something like that, is to move to more adverbial functions of the infinitive. Uh, this is probably one of the more common functions where the infinitive Again, to put this up here, if I put the leg or the branch off the verb uh, with the you know, modifier bucket or container, uh, the adverb modifier container, an infinitive can fill that slot. So you'll sometimes find infinitives functioning as adverbial, that is, verb modifiers. Uh, for example, in Mark chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, Mark chapter 3 and verse 10, an example of an, uh, uh, an infinitive on its own functioning adverbially. Um, I don't know if you can scratch it out. I, that's not the right verse I wanted. Or if you can... Where did that go? Oh, there it is. Um, 
An example of the adverbial infinitive is found in Luke 19 and 10. In Luke 19.10, uh, Luke 19.10, there it is, uh, we find this statement um, concluding Jesus' interaction with Zacchaeus, and it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And it begins, it begins with a verb, ailthen. There's your main verb. Uh, for the Son of Man and I won't write out the entirety of the sentence, but uh, the Son of Man came, that's your subject, the Son of Man came and then there's two infinitives. Zetesai and sosai. And both of these infinitives modify the verb came, in this case indicating purpose. And uh, the, the purpose or the reason for why the Son of Man came. And as I said earlier, uh, sometimes you can translate Greek infinitives like in English, to do this, to do that, to run, to speak. And other times you can't. We'll see some examples in a little bit. But in this case, the Son of Man, here you could translate them just like an English infinitive. The Son of Man came to seek and to save. Uh, you could also... Probably the meaning being expressed here is purpose. You could also just translate it, the Son of Man came in order to seek and in order to save, to bring out the, the feature of purpose. But however you translate it, the idea is, uh, here's an example of two infinitives that fill the adverbial container, the verb modifier container, and here expressing purpose. So just be aware of that. Uh, usually, usually the infinitive will be will not have the article. There are instances where the infinitive will take the article to a genitive singular article to right before it to express the inf the uh, purpose, especially. Uh, but uh, there's a you know a number of of things that the infinitive could express the adverbial infinitive uh, that. Only the context can help you indicate that and determine that. But uh, I just show you this as an example of an infinitive functioning as an adverb, filling the adverb my modifier slot. An interesting use of the infinitive that is fairly common in the Greek New Testament, and this one you do have to be fairly flexible in the way you translate it, and, and also, this is another one that, this is fairly easy to spot because, uh, and we've already looked at an example of one, in a sense, but we'll, we'll return to it and unpack it a little bit. But this is easy, easy to spot because this construction with the infinitive has three elements to it, and they all have to be present, and they will be in this exact order. And it's this, a preposition followed by an article, followed by the infinitive. So preposition, article, infinitive. In this type of construction, which we'll talk about in a moment, these three will always be present and they will always be in that order. So again, uh, you know, people say, oh, Greek doesn't worry about word order. Uh, that's only partially correct. Here's an example of where the word order will not be violated. And again, you'll always have these three, a preposition, an article, and an infinitive, and they will always occur in this precise order. Now, there could be some modifiers in there of the infinitive or whatever, but, uh, but you'll have these three things in this order. Now, what is going on here is this entire construction. Basically, the infinitive is functioning as the object of the preposition. So it's, it's acting like a noun. 
It's the object of the preposition. And the article is demonstrating it's a noun. But this whole construction, this whole construction will fill the verb modifier container. That is, it's not just the infinitive, it's the entire construction will function adverbially to modify the verb. So be aware of this construction. We'll look at a couple of examples, but uh, and, and the, the meaning, the adverbial idea or meaning that this construction can convey will be determined by the preposition. And it's not that all prepositions can be used, there's only a handful of them, but the preposition article infinitive can express different verbal ideas like time or cause or, or purpose depending on the preposition that is used. But the entire construction, preposition article infinitive, can fill the container of an adverb modifier or a verb modifier or an adverb. Now, as I said, here you have to be, uh, uh, the best thing is to show you a couple of examples, but here you have to be very flexible in how you interpret it, or how you translate it, I mean. Uh, sometimes you can use the word to eat, to read, to speak, whatever. Uh, at other times that won't work. It'll sound very, very awkward. Uh, but a good example of this, a good example of this use of the infinitive, well, before I do, uh, there are basically four possibilities when it comes to this function of the infinitive. One of them is this construction, again, we're only talking about preposition, article, infinitive, and that whole construction functioning like an adverb, filling the container uh, of modifying the verb. Uh, it can spread, one thing it can do is express time. Um, for example, I'm going to use the the common term luo, luo that is used in most grammars to illustrate how endings develop, but meta ta luain. Uh, if I were to translate this literally, uh, after the to loose, I mean that just doesn't make any sense. So instead I have to ask, well what's the force of this? It, it indicates time after which which is the meaning of the participle, meta, after. And, and sometimes I might have to, based on the context, in my translation, insert a subject. Uh, we'll just use the word she, the pronoun she for now. So after she loosed, or after she, uh, you know, after she looses. And that whole thing then would fill the container of the modifier of the verb. So whatever the verb is, uh, um, you know, he, he left the city after she loosed. I know that doesn't make any sense, but I'm trying to just illustrating how this construction functions. But, but do you see, you, you have to be a little bit flexible with the, the translation. To translate this woodenly after the to loose just wouldn't make any sense. Um, so I have to ask, well, what's the force? What's the meaning of this? And then what would be a way to translate that in English that would bring that across in a way that makes sense? Another construction dealing with time is en to. This indicates time, uh, contemporaneous time, or the, the, the action of this construction takes place at the same time as the main verb that it, it, that it modifies. And again, if I were to translate this literally or woodenly, in the to loose, that doesn't make any sense. But recognizing what this construction means, it means c action that takes place at the same time as the verb it modifies. Uh, you would translate it something like, while she looses, or while she is loosing, something like that. And then the last one, as far as time, um, the last one is,
whoops, pra to luein, and this would be action that takes place prior to or pra, before. So again, if I were to translate this literally before the to loose, that just doesn't make any sense in this case. So recognizing that this indicates action that takes place prior to, so before she looses would be a way to translate it. But those are all examples of the infinitive, and these are the main prepositions that will occur that can indicate time. And once more, what you're looking for is what these have in common, they have all three of these elements, a preposition, an article, and an infinitive in that order. And the other thing you're going to see is, again, not all the, infin uh, not all the prepositions that you learn uh, are used in this way. We're, we're going to see there's only a, uh, a handful of them, kind of a large handful, but there's only a handful of infinitives used in this way. So the first one is time. Another common construction again dealing with the same preposition article infinitive is to show purpose or result purpose or result um, the most common one is ace plus ta plus the infinitive um, or again, to use the word that we've been using, luain. Again, to try to translate this literally into the Toulouse. It just doesn't make any sense. But remember, we talked a little bit about one of the functions of ace is not just to indicate physical motion into, but goal or purpose. And, and so it's used with this in this construction to indicate this entire construction can indicate purpose. And you can translate it that way, in order to loose, or in order that she looses, might be appropriate in certain contexts. There's not always one exact way to translate some of these constructions, but, uh, but uh, or with the result that she loosed, or so that she looses, or something like that, if it's showing result. The other, the other one would be pros. Pros ta luain. Again, if I tried to do this literally, to or toward the to loose doesn't make sense. But again, this expresses purpose. You probably won't translate it any differently than ace ta luain in order to loose, or in order that she looses, or if it's result, so that she looses, or something like that, that expresses purpose or result. Another one, the third use of, of this construction is to show cause. And this will be with the preposition dia ta luain. Dia ta luain. Again, bec if I tried to translate this literally, because the to loose. But again, because she looses, or something like that, because he looses. Here, in this case, you're probably going to have to add a subject from the, from the context. There may not be one. There could. You might have a subject in the accusative case. But if there's not one, you might have to add one to your translation just to make it make sense. Instead of because looses, that wouldn't make sense. But because she looses, we kind of require one in English if there's not one expressed in Greek. So cause. And then finally, finally means. Ento luain. Uh, now you'll notice this is similar to the the use of this prep this preposition under time. So you're going to have to rely on context to tell is it expressing time or maybe means. Again, in the to loose. If I tried to be too wooden, that doesn't make sense. But by loosing, uh, that would be one way to translate it if it's indicating means.
So those are all the examples or all the possibilities when it comes to this unique construction. Again, what these all have in common is preposition, article, infinitive in that order. And these four things, these four meanings are what they can express and you'll translate it in a way that brings out that meaning but doesn't sound overly awkward in English, whether you're, it's indicating time or purpose, cause or means. Uh, to give you an example, to go back to the uh, to go back to the Philippians passage, uh, Philippians chapter 1, and the verse that we already looked at in illustrating in verse 7, in illustrating illustrating the uh, two accusatives and which one's subject and which one is the direct object is, let me erase this first. Back to Philippians 1.7, you have the construction dia, ta, Ekane. And notice this fits perfectly preposition, article, and infinitive. And we noted from our uh, illustration a moment ago, our discussion, that this construction indicates cause. So it's indicating the cause of the verb it modifies, which at the beginning of verse 7 is esten. Just as it is right to think this because. I have you in my heart. And here's a good example of, you know, to try to translate this literally or woodenly, because the to have me in the heart, you, and it just doesn't make sense. So you have to translate it in a way that makes sense in English, but it also communicates the idea of cause. So because, and then again, this is followed by the two direct, the two accusatives, because meh, I have you in my heart. And it goes back and modifies, it is right to think this because, dia ta ekin, because I have you in my heart. Another example of an infinitive construction is found, um, is found in chapter 6 of Romans. And in verse 12, just to give you a, a different kind of construction, In Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, where uh, in this section Paul is arguing uh, justification by faith has moral implications. Uh, if we've been justified by faith, that is not an excuse for sinning and allowing sin. Uh, uh, Paul begins a section by saying, should we go on sinning so that great grace may increase? Does God's grace and forgiveness and just being justified by faith apart from works of the law, is that an excuse for sin? And Paul says, by no means. And then in verse 12, he issues a command, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Uh, so the main, the main verb is, the imperative basileueto. Uh, you'll note, if you remember our discussion of imperatives, this is a present prohibition. Do, therefore, do not let sin reign. And it goes on and says, in your mortal bodies. But notice what comes next. Ace, ta, a uh, hoopa hoopa kuane. There's your infinitive ending ain, but notice ace ta infinitive. And from that little discussion we had, the kind of little chart I put up, ace followed by an article followed by an infinitive indicates purpose, and so it's indicating the purpose for not letting sin reign in order that. So you could translate that in order that 
or in order to obey its lust, or in order that you might obey its lust, or in order to obey its desires or its lust, epithumiais. So, uh, again, this is rather easy to spot. It's an easy construction to spot because it has these three things in that order. And then when I see this, I look at it and say, well, what's, what's the meaning of this kind of construction? Well, it expresses purpose. So I'll translate it in a way, and I'll show that it connects to the verb that, it's, that the whole construction is modifying. I'll translate it in a way that brings across purpose. So do not let sin reign in order to obey or in order that you obey its lust or its desires. So this is a fairly common construction in the Greek New Testament, and uh, you need to be aware of it. You need to uh, be able to translate it when you see it. But uh, again, there's no one, often there's no one correct way to translate. Sometimes students get, uh, especially early on in Greek, get hung up on what's the right way, the one right way to translate it. Uh, by saying there's different ways, it doesn't mean anything goes. There are wrong ways, there are better, there are not so good ways, and there are better ways. Uh, certainly we want to focus on what's the best way to translate it, but sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes there might be different ways to bring out a construction in Greek. And this is one of them, where there aren't any real hard and fast rules for how you translate this construction. Uh, the main point is not to be too wooden with it, uh, but to be a little bit more flexible. But make sure your translation brings out the meaning of, of these constructions in Greek. This is Dr. Dave Mathewson in his teaching on third semester New Testament Greek. This is session number 13, Genitive Absolute and Infinitives.